If you would, bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you in truth and in honesty, Father God. We come before you today and we surrender ourselves to you, Lord. I ask you to be with those that are here today. Let their ears be open, their hearts be receptive, and their minds be understanding of the words that you have chosen to be shared, Father. For those that are on our prayer list, we had first Sunday praise and prayer this morning, and I ask you, Father God, Jehovah Rapha, the healer, those that are needing healing today, Father, be with them, Lord. Those that are, that are having family issues and difficulties in understanding, Lord, be their banner. Jehovah Nisi, go before them, Father. And, and I pray for them today, Lord, for understanding and healing. And Lord, I lift up this country to you, and I pray for revival in this land, Father. It starts with us, and Lord, I just pray that it happens now. For, the, for those that are still learning and understanding who you are and coming up in the Lord, Lord, Father, just be with them and touch them. For those of us here at Transformation, Father, I speak blessings upon those that are here today to hear your word, either in person or online, Father, just be with them all. We thank you for everything that you do. We thank you for our veterans. We thank you for our, our military serving today and those that have served in the past. And Father, we lift up our firefighters and police to you as well. And I speak protection on them, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, watch your eyes as Karen turns on the light. Reach around and tell somebody hi. You're glad to see him as Rebecca makes her way up here to give you some announcements. Hello. How are you? I think she's bringing up a little friend with her as she comes today. Then we both do a trouble. Oh dear. I don't think this world can handle two of me. I don't think it could. No. No. We go to hell real quick. <laughs> All righty. If you will find your seats for me, we'll get started. Graham was supposed to sit with James, but he didn't like James, so he came with me. Sorry. <laughs> Some people don't. I'm sorry. All right, just a few announcements for you today. Uh, giving, if you feel compelled to give, you can give in the basket by the door. You can give online at findtransformation.com slash giving. You can text the word transformation to 830-293-4483, or you can give on our app. Hopefully everybody has received their giving statements by now. If you have not, please let us know and we can print you a new copy. If you have a Facebook page, go ahead and pull your phone out, please, and go to uh, check in and show everybody where you come to church so that you can uh, bring more people to us. We are happy to pray with you at any time. You can text the word prayer to 830-293-4483. You can write your prayer request on the back of a transformation card right outside the door. Or you can just come up to us and we're happy to pray with you at any time. Uh, today, this morning at First Sunday Praise and Prayer, there was a lot of amazing prayers going on and we are thankful for that. With that being said, there is a prayer list outside the door if you would like to pick one up. It's an updated copy. We'll do that in paper once a month for you. If you don't have our app yet, um, we've got Church by Ministry 1. It, you can download it from the App Store or Google Play. And you can, uh, once you have that downloaded, search for Transformation Church Kerrville. You have access to our sermons, ways to give, ways to contact, put your prayer request in, and access to the sermons. Twice Come and follow us on all of our social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. If you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, please go take a second and do that. All right. We still need Children's Church volunteers. Annie is in there today, so if you have a kiddo with you, but I think all kiddos are mostly in there. Um, and we're, we've got it once or every first Sunday. Um, and any other time that somebody volunteers, it's usually the last Sunday of the month as well. So if you would like to volunteer and teach the curriculum yourself, please let us know and we can help you sign up for that. First Sunday Whoop. Praise and Prayer is not next week. This is a typo in there. It will be the first Sunday of March, though, again. Just remember, every first Sunday at 9.15. Freedom Group was delayed. It was supposed to start January 31st, but uh, Devil tried to get in the way with that, with the ice storm. Uh, that really didn't show up. So <laughs> we are happy for y'all to come and join us. We have not started yet. We will start this Tuesday, though, 
at six o'clock at mom and dad's house. If you need maps, mom has maps with her. Um, and then that way we can make sure you arrive to the right place. Potluck Sunday is on, going to be on February 19th. Uh, we're going to be celebrating the second anniversary of Transformation Church. There is a sign up for sides and desserts right outside the door. Just click or, or put a check on what column you want to bring. Um, we will have chicken and then the Leonards and the Joneses uh, volunteered to buy and, buy and cook a brisket. So we will have that available for you as the main uh, meat of the meal. Taste and See is next week, uh, February 12th. Uh, Dana mentioned that this would be fitting for the potluck uh, sermon because it's Taste and See, but Dad didn't think that one through. So <laughs> we are going to go with today <laughs> and finish with love God, love people. You know, she drops me in the grease every chance she can get. Talk about throwing you under the bus. I'm sorry? Talk about throwing you I know. under the bus. I, I give her a stand to, you know, just... Help with her speaking skills, and what does she do? <laughs> That's what she does. I love it. Yeah, I, I did think that was kind of funny that, that we should have done Taste and See for the potluck, but originally the potluck was supposed to be next week, but it's Super Bowl Sunday, and I just didn't flip the messages around. So, yeah, my fault. Anyway, good morning, church. We are so glad you are here with us today. We want you to know how much we love you and we care for you, and I hope you truly, truly feel that every time you walk through these doors. And if you read our email messages, this is something that is near and dear to our heart. That's why we love this sermon series so much. Love God, love people. That is what we are all about. I'm so glad you're here with us today, though, as we are wrapping up the series, Love God, Love People. Now, we've talked a lot over the last four weeks about God's love and the first and second greatest commandment that Christ gave us was in week one. And we looked at the example of Christ that he set for us in our week two message. And last week we talked about the difficulty of loving others in the middle of sin and brokenness. So today we're tying this all together and we're looking at what's called the permanence of love. And the importance of sowing love into the world that is around us. As an example of this love-filled posture, I want to share a story about one of the most selfless people of our time, Mother Teresa. In the book titled, Inspiring Stories from People Who Met Mother Teresa, there's a story that really was near and dear to my heart. I really enjoyed reading it, so I'm going to share that one with you today. It said, during my first encounters with Mother Teresa, I was stuck by her profound humility I knew that she was world famous, and I had imagined that all famous people have a sense of their own greatness, a pride that shows through in their words and manners. There was none of that in Mother Teresa. There was an apparent selflessness in her, a quality that is not easy to find, even in non-famous people. It was if she was totally unaware of herself, as if she was aware of only God and others. I had never met anyone in my life as humble as Mother Teresa. She was as humble as the poor whom we would lift up out of the gutters. Her humility was strikingly beautiful to me. Mother Teresa embodied so many other qualities as well, qualities that are all too rare in the world today. Humble, kind, caring, compassionate. Those are all the qualities that Mother Teresa shared with others, and these are several of the specific ways we are called to love others as we follow Jesus. What we haven't discussed yet in this series is the internal impact of our choices and how they affect others and the importance of keeping a long view of love. The Gospels and the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Now I go back to the verse that is central to the theme of our series. In fact, it's the verse that I derive the name and the title from. We look at Matthew 22, 34 through 39 again. It says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this 
question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He was looking for an answer of the ten that God gave Moses. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So is it possible that Jesus simplified the commandments for us to help us stay focused on what matters most? Loving God, loving people. Maybe he was trying to get our energy fixated on one of the few things that will last throughout eternity. Love remains. Who here today is familiar with the love chapter of the Bible? Okay? If you've ever been to a wedding, chances are high that you have heard some part of this chapter. It's quoted or referenced. It's a powerful passage with deeply insightful truths about love. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's 1 Corinthians 13. And in the back half of this chapter, the Apostle Paul says something amazing about love, which is especially pertinent to our time today. And I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about the time in which we live. Let's look at some incredibly important and often overlooked verses. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 3. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. It says, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You see, church, love never fails. But all prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, that's going to fade away. What's Paul talking about here to the church of Corinth? To understand these statements, we really do need to look back at the beginning of this love chapter. So let's backtrack just a minute and look at 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, for our understanding. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not love, I gain nothing. These are all spiritual gifts that Paul is talking about. Gifts that the church in Corinth were magnifying. The context of verses 8 through 13 is affirming that all spiritual gifts will stop. But love will never end. There is no emphasis or time element of one gift versus another. Spiritual gifts are only part of time, not eternity. Love is eternal. Are you getting that? Do you hear that? We've got to be careful not to apply too much emphasis on the things that won't last. In the case of the Corinthian church, they were all wrapped up in spiritual gifting, so much so that it was to the detriment of their call to love one another. Paul recognized that, and he called them out on it. 
What things do we apply too much emphasis on in our church and our church culture? What things are we focused on, possibly to the detriment of Jesus' command to love God and to love people? Let's talk a minute about where we put our emphasis. And to do that, I'm going to share a story about mine. I, in business, I have done nothing but commission sales. That's all I've ever done. That means I've never had a salary, per se, or an hourly wage. Some people look at that and they say it's feast or famine, and yes, it's true, it is. But that's what I chose. And Karen and I, we've had a pretty good life. I truly believe that God has honored what I've done. Now, I say this to talk about the emphasis that I put on sales. See, I would do all the goal planning that they tell you to do. I'd do everything that I could. I'd, how much did I want to make this month? How many days did I want to work this month? And then I backtrack all those numbers into seeing how much I had to do per day, how much average sale that I needed to make. And then at the end of the month, if it was getting close and I hadn't met my goal yet, how much more would I need to do? How many more things would I have to sell? Or if I was way ahead, how much more time could I take off? I was focused and emphasizing the numbers and the sales. I would track these numbers and adjust them as necessary. I focused, again, on the numbers. Numbers that had no real bearing in my life. I was focused on success and not God. Sure, I was a believer. I gave him credit for all that I had, but my emphasis was not on him as much as it was my abilities and skill that he had given me. Now, I'm certain there's many here today that understand, at least in concept, of what I'm trying to say. And you could easily plug your life into my story. But I want to look at it now in a different light. Not me personally, but us, corporately, as a church. Where do we put our emphasis? What's important or what should be most important to us? Is it growth? Is it our music? Our own building? Your awesome preaching? None of these things matter in the grand scheme of things. Our emphasis needs to be on the lost. Those that are far from Jesus. Our emphasis should be on those not coming to church because of the hurts that they've experienced through religion. Our emphasis needs to be on building a community that supports each other no matter what our background or our differences may be. Church, if we focus our emphasis on these things, guess what happens? We grow even more. We have more people stepping up and our music gets even better. We can financially support a place that we can call our own and your preaching gets even more awesome. <laughs> Told you they laugh. I just, just say. So in two weeks, we are going to be celebrating our second anniversary as a church. Our real date, though, is February 7th. Just two days from now. Two years ago, we started with eight people in this room. One year later, we had over 25. Now, here we are a year later. And we've had almost 60 people in this room. And there's 70 that are actually on our membership rosters. 70 people have come through here. That, that's it. Thank you. Donna, I love that. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Because we are growing. Because I think this is our emphasis as a church. But I want you to buy in. I want you to realize that it has nothing to do with where we are or what we do. And we've got some exciting things that we bring into the church. We really do. But guys, our emphasis needs to be on the lost. Our emphasis needs to be on those that are part of the body of Christ but don't want to be part of the body. Think about that for a minute. When you know someone who stays at home and says, I don't need to go in church, what if they're the hand that we need? Or they're the foot that we need to walk and take another step? Because that's what the body of Christ is. It's the people. It's not the building. Everyone has a place in the building, the church of Christ. Make sense? <sighs> I'm 
excited about what God is doing for transformation. I really am. I, I'm excited about what he's done. I'm excited of what he's doing for Kerrville and for Kerr County. And I'm happy that you are coming and doing life with us here because that matters to us. We are doing what he has called us to do. Now, for many of us, as we get older, we experience more of life. And we realize there's only a few important things that we really should focus on. We begin to see more clearly that things like our profession and our possessions aren't truly as important as the people that are around us, the family that we associate with. The clarity seems to be a bit of what Paul is describing in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 12. He compares what we see now to seeing our reflection in a mirror, which at that time of his writing, you would have, it would have been very dim and imperfect. They didn't have glass mirrors. Corinth was famous, however, for its polished metal mirrors. They were the best available in the day, in that age, but they still reflected a distorted image. Have you ever walked up to, stay, to stainless steel, that polished, beautiful stainless steel, and seen your reflection? It's visible, but it's distorted. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He knew those kind of metals. No matter how much you polish metal, the image will not be as clear as it is with glass. What we see and understand now is a dim reflection of a divine reality. It's a gross understatement to say that there's still so much we just don't know. Because there's a ton that we just don't know. With that said, though, we can know what God revealed to us through his word. And this brings us back to 1 Corinthians 13. Let me reread Chapter 13, verse 13, it says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Paul tells us that three things will remain, and the greatest of these is love. It is the greatest because the others will cease at the consummation of the new age. Faith will no longer be needed because it will turn to sight. Hope will be fulfilled with the return of Jesus Christ. But love will remain because it's the basic character of God. Church, we won't need faith. We'll see God. We won't need hope because we'll be living there with him. And all we will need is what remains, and that is love. Again, love is the character of God. Scripture proves it. John 3, 16 said, For God so loved the world. God is love. Love remains past all other things because love, again, is the basic character of God. It saturates his being and flows through all that he does. 1 John 4, 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. Church, are you getting this? God is love. When all else fades away, when nothing of this life that we know remains, God will still be there. His love will still be there. And for us as believers, we trust by faith that we will spend eternity with God, engulfed, submerged, and inundated in his love. 1 John 4.16, it says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God. And God in them. Scripture says that so many times. God is love. But our thick skulls don't always get it, do they? This reality brings to sharp focus the call and the command that Christ found in John 13, 34 through 35. When he gave us the new command, he said, A new command I give you, love one another. 
If you watch the news today, are we fulfilling that command? He tells us how to do it. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So how did Jesus love you? He died on the cross for your sins. I'm not telling you to go get crucified. But that's love. We should die to our sins each and every day to show our love to Jesus. Because when we do that, we'll be willing to serve our fellow man. Because that is love. He goes on to say that by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Do you know anybody in this room know somebody who says they're a believer? But their actions are so different than what God tells us there. I've been guilty of that myself. I think we all have. But this is a gentle reminder from the word of God of how we are to treat one another. Love. This is what matters. This is what will last above all other things. Love is the most powerful force in the world that you will ever find. Martin Luther, Jean, Martin Luther King Jr. said it like this. We must discover the power of love. The power. The redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. We will be able to make men better. Love is the only way. Amen. He was wise. And we all know what happened to him. Are we willing to possibly have that happen to us? Are we willing to take a stand for the gospel like he did out of his comfort zone and do what God has commanded us to do? Stand firm then and show love. How has the power of love impacted your life? Where have you seen redemption, forgiveness, or compassion? How do you love others? If love truly is what really matters, if it is the greatest commandment, greater than even faith and hope, then I know there are a lot of us in this room who need to take a long look at our priorities and our energies. We've got to think about how we're investing in the world around us. Do we have a posture of humility, compassion, grace? Or do we see the world with selfish and self-serving eyes? What's in it for me? Have we heard that a hundred times? Have you ever said it? Have you ever felt it, thought it? If we look first and foremost to what we can gain or how we can build bigger storehouses for ourselves, it's not what God asks us to do. Remember, what we see here and now, it's only a distorted reflection of the divine reality that we'll experience one day with Jesus. We walk by faith, not sight, as we follow the example of Christ. He is our good shepherd. Now, I'm sure many of us have thought about love at some point in the course of our lives. We hear about it on the radio. We see it portrayed in movies. We say it all the time. I love that pizza or I love this song. But I'm not sure we think much about how love plays in the gospel. It was because God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. 
And as we learned today, God, in fact, is love. So it makes sense that Jesus would sum all the writings of the law and the prophets by simply saying, love God, love people. It's our simple call, church. As difficult as any instruction in its application and execution, but it couldn't be a simpler command to memorize or meditate on. So what do we do about it? First of all, we need to take some time today or this week and do an honest inventory of your own life. Where do you see love at work? How do you actively love God? Or how do you actively love others? And if you feel a great deficiency in those areas, what are you going to do about it? If you need to speak to me as your pastor or a prayer partner, please let me know. We'll be happy to pray with you. If you have unforgiveness hindering you from loving others, Again, come talk to us. Let us help you through that with the Word of God. Secondly, you need to take a look at where you spend your time, your energy, and your money. Does it align with the things that you say you love? Does it align with the things that God has instructed you to love? Him, people. If not, then consider some actionable steps that you can take to bring more clarity, to bring love and alignment to your time, your energy, and your money. And finally, if you haven't heard God loves you, <laughs> you must have been asleep for the past four weeks. And that's okay. Let me tell you today that he does. He absolutely loves you. He loves you so much, he sent Jesus into the world to live, die, and conquer death, and rise again, triumphant, so that we could see the victory. God loves you on your worst days just as much as he does on your best days. He even loves you if you have been actively ignoring him your entire life. If you've been angry with him, he still loves you. If you're unconvinced that he exists, it's okay. He still loves you. He's real, church. The world will try to tell you that either God is not real and Jesus was just a man, or some will go so far to say that Jesus was real, but he isn't the only way to heaven. Buddha, Muhammad, Mother Earth, or just about any other thing that can be worshipped are his equal. This is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Jesus is the only way. He's the light of the world. The Son of God, the resurrected King. He gave us a command to love God with everything that we have and to love others the same way. He made them an equal command. He did not make it a suggestion. You know, there is a difference between a command and a suggestion, right? Church, if you're not loving the homeless as much as you love God, there is a problem. If you're not loving someone that's not like you as much as you love God, there is a problem. And if we can't be a church that loves everyone, there's a problem. I was challenged the other day by another pastor when he asked me the vision of our church. I told him at Transformation, we help you learn how to love God, love people, find freedom, and discover what God has designed you for. He said, yeah, yeah, you and a thousand other churches say the same thing. It sounds good, warm, and fuzzy, but it's just a bunch of words. I dare him to come see. Come and see what we do at Transformation. 
Those of you who visited, why are you still here? You felt love, right? You felt a home. You felt cared for. That's what we are. Some people don't understand it, but there is one thing I want you to take from this past four weeks. And it is this. We are all children of God. He loves us all. Therefore, we must love each other. Love that is bigger than our differences. Love that is true and not just a word. Real, genuine, agape love. If the world is to know we are Christians by our fruit, the first fruit is love. God is love. You want to know something? He loves you. And you, 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 and you. God loves you. Love is permanent. It is the only thing that will remain. So church, love God and love people. It really is that simple. Amen. So join me in prayer, please. Father, forgive us for making this life complicated. We've allowed the world to tell us what we should feel and believe and do and say and act. When your word was clear, love you, love others. Lord, I pray that we all can leave here today with a new understanding of this love God, love people, and truly show it to the masses in what we say, what we do, how we react, where we go, what we watch, what we hear, what we type. Lord, if anyone in this room today needs that, needs that option to be closer to you, that doesn't know you the way that we should, that hasn't relied on Jesus as their Lord and Savior, hasn't made that proclamation, I ask that the Holy Spirit today touch them. Right where you're at with all eyes closed and heads bowed, if that's you, just raise your hand. Let me just see where you are today. And if not, that's okay. God loves you. He wants to be with you in all of eternity. He's there for you. For the rest of us, if you would, just repeat these words. Dear Jesus, thank you for being Lord of my life. I submit to you again today all my heart, my desires, my actions. Teach me, Father, to love others as deeply as you love me. Forgive my sins, Father God, and cleanse me today. In your name I pray. Amen. Church, let's get together and take communion. Let's talk to God. Tell him what's on your heart today. Tell him what's on your mind. Does everybody have elements? Anybody need any? If you would, just peel back and take out the wafer. And I want you to just look at this. Kind of different today. I'm going to talk about this wafer. It's, it's kind of like a wedding ring. It's a perfect circle. No beginning, no end. If that's not a representation of God, I don't know what is. But this represents something deeper than that. This represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
As he was in the upper room with his disciples on the night he was betrayed, he broke bread with them and said, This is my body, which will be broken for you. He did it as being the last lamb ever to be slain. The last, the last sacrifice. And he told them that every time you take of this, remember me. Jesus then took the cup of wine and after giving thanks, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant been shed for the forgiveness of sins once and for all. Your past, your present, and what you're going to do tomorrow. Heck, what you're going to do three minutes after you walk out of this place. You're forgiven. Why? Because God loves you. He made a way to him for all eternity. And Jesus said, every time you drink of this cup, remember me. You bow your heads again, please. Father, you are, you're everything. I don't know the needs of everyone, Father, but you do. I intervene for them today. I ask you to be there for them and with them. Prayers that are spoken and unspoken, Lord, you know what they are, and I ask you to be the name that they need today. Jehovah Rapha for healing. Jehovah Nisi, the banner that goes before. Jehovah Shalom, the peace that only comes from you. Lord, thank you for just being you. For teaching us how to love you and to love others. Lord, I ask you to be with those that are here today, those watching online, whatever that may be, Lord. Touch their lives. Become real to them. And as we lift transformation up to you, Father God, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, go into the world loving God, loving people, and living your design. See you next week.